everybody. Good to see you all today. And look, we do extend a special welcome to the families of all the, the lovely wee ones that we've dedicated today. And we don't take it for lightly the opportunity and the privilege that it is to have spiritual charge, as it were, for the, for the nurture of your children. So we, that, we're blessed that you would trust us with that as well. I'm sure you can see and, and Karen and her team that there's a genuine affection there uh, for the children they're loved on, they're cared for, uh, and they really do treat them like their own. So, look, it's our privilege. So good that you've joined us today. Hope you feel comfortable and at home with us, as I do all of you. Um, it's great to see so many out. Last week, um, we began a new series of messages under the title, What's the Point? And Jason uh, asked perhaps the ultimate existential question, what's the point of life or what's the point of me? And so hopefully uh, you're convinced that life does have a point, that it's worth living, and I'll trust that because you came back again, um, you're now convinced of that. So today we move on to the second installment of our series, and my brief, if you like, was to consider what's the point of uh, relationships. But I want to narrow the focus of that slightly because it seems to me that the point of some relationships seems fairly obvious. You don't need me to preach a sermon on that because... We have romantic relationships. The reason that any of us are sitting here today is because of a romantic or an erotic relationship. Now, without going into the details or going down that path, obviously, we had all these nice wee ones here today, and I trust you all know that they were not delivered to a doorstep by a long-legged, long-beaked waiting bird. A relationship has taken place there. Not only that, we had these kids up and we prayed over them, so they're going to need nurture, they're going to need cared for. There's a parental relationship there. And so if you like, romantic relationship is why we exist. The parental relationship is why we survive. Both of them are necessities. You can't do without both of them. Let me give you another type of relationship, which if you like, pushes itself on you. It's the vocational relationships. In other words, you need to know people in order to make money. You need to know people. You need to have a, a network or, or colleagues in order to do business, to have a job, to have a career, to climb the ladder, to get through life. These relationships are different. They're useful to you because they take us somewhere. However, what I want to talk to you about today is what C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four Loves, calls the least necessary, the least instinctive of all relationships. Society says that you, can't, you can get by without it, but the Bible is absolutely clear that you cannot really, truly live without it. I'm talking, of course, this morning about friendship. See, in this fast-paced, achievement-based, self-propagating, self-promoting society that we find ourselves in, relationships, sadly, are prioritized by the measure of their usefulness. And so we spend time with people because of what I can get from it, how it advances my cause, my agenda. And so in a sense, we treat people as a means to an end. And in a society like that, you can be sure that the one relationship that will get pushed to the side invariably and set aside because we don't have time for it, is friendship. Friendship. Friendship is different to every other relationship to C.S. Lewis because it doesn't push itself on you out of necessity. It do, it's, not, it's not that essential. It doesn't push itself. It's not, there's not something within inside you that calls for it. Rather, he says, it is absolutely deliberate. It is intentional time spent over time. And the message of the Bible, Green Pastures, is this. Without friendship, we will not make it. We will not be all that we've been purposed to be, called to be, to the glory and praise of God. And so today, just for a few moments, I want us to look at what the Bible says, particularly what the book of Proverbs has to say about friendship. Let's just pray before we begin. Father, uh, we come into your presence this morning. We thank you that you're here. And our one request is this, that you would glorify your son, magnify your son in this place. May we see him as he is. And would you draw people to him today, Lord, I pray you would lighten our hearts and lighten our minds. Help us to be obedient to your word. Loose us with it today, we pray, O oh God, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And so today I'm going to begin with the why. Why friendship is important. We'll move then to the, the how. How do we make friends? How does that happen? And then finally, I'll look at what does it mean to be a friend? What does the profile of a friend look like? 
So here we go. Number one, why friendship matters. In John 15, it's a passage we've looked at often over the last weeks and months. Jesus is describing himself as the true vine. And within that passage, he tells his disciple to abide in my love as I abide in the love of my Father. So what he's saying to them is, the nature of relationship that I have with my Father is how you ought to relate to each other here on earth. And so he makes this wonderful statement in John 15, 15. He says, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. Friends. And see, from all eternity, the Father and Son have existed in relationship. From the beginning of time, they have existed, or outside of time, they've, be, they've existed bound in friendship love. And because, friends, we are made in God's image, we are made for friendship. Think about this. Every other relationship in your life has a beginning. Marriage was created. Parents are created. The networks, the work relationships you have are created. The only relationship that never had a beginning was never created as friendship. Friendship is part of the eternal nature of God. There never was a time when there was not friendship. Never. And this will probably mess with your head a wee bit. But back in Genesis, remember that God made Adam, and he made Adam in a state of perfection, and he said that it wasn't good. Adam was perfect, and God said it wasn't good that Adam be alone. Why? Because Adam was like God, and God is not alone. Adam wasn't lonely because he was perfect. Sorry, Adam wasn't lonely because he was imperfect. He wasn't lonely because he'd messed things up and made mistakes. Adam was lonely because he was perfect. You see, every other problem in our lives arises out of our sin, our mistakes, our imperfection. But loneliness is the one problem we have because we're made in God's image. You can't get away from it. You know, one of the things we've ongoingly heard in respect of this coronavirus pandemic is how much loneliness is on the rise, isolation, and then it, um, uh, it impacts people's mental health, multitudes suffering from, from illness and all the associated health effects of that, and how we affect have a pandemic of a physical virus, but the reality is we also have a pandemic of an emotional one. But I want to submit to you this morning that perhaps COVID-19 has not so much caused loneliness and isolation as much as it's exposed it. It's exposed it. You see, relationships based on usefulness. So when the work stopped, when everything ground to a halt, when life as we knew it stopped and the dust settled, and in a moment of quiet, we realized we had been running so fast that we never had time for friends. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves sitting in silence and sitting alone. And I want to tell you this today. The remedy is not found in a prescription. It's found in a friend. You cannot fix an eternal problem with a man-made solution. So why does friendship matter? Number one, we were made for it. Number two, friendship makes us. Proverbs 13 verse 20 is probably one of the most instructive life verses in the Bible. It says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. See, that idea of walking with someone, it's a Hebrew metaphor, if you like, for a friendship. Right in the beginning, the Bible says that God walked in the garden with Adam in the cool of the day. The metaphor was friendship. He walked with Abraham. It was a friendship relationship. And so what this verse is essentially saying is that friendship is the most formative factor in each and every one of our lives. Get your friends right, and you'll set yourself up for blessing and success. Get them wrong, and you'll set yourself up for trouble. If you remember last time, for those of you that were here, we were speaking on kindness. I reminded you of how Solomon's son Rehoboam divided a kingdom in the Old Testament. I said this, the greatest division on the pages of your Old Testament Bible was caused through a failure to be kind. Rehoboam took the throne, if you remember. Now Solomon, his father, had worked the people really hard. He had taxed them. He had levied high level of work on them. People were discouraged. The heart was knocked out of them. And these senior advisors, they came to Rehoboam when he took the, the throne and they tried to give him advice. They says, look, you need to lighten the load a bit here. You need to relax things. These people will serve you. They want to serve you, but you need to make some changes. But Rehoboam shunned the advice of these older men 
and instead listened to a bunch of morons that he'd knew or he'd known since he was young, friends he'd, he'd grown up with. And so I said last time, when we were talking about the fruit of the Spirit, it says the greatest division on the pages of your Old Testament was caused through a failure to be kind. But step back from that just a moment, and you'll see that the reason that happened was that a man gathered up for himself a companionship of fools. And a companion of fools will suffer harm. Craig Rochelle says you are the average of your five closest friends. You're the average of your five closest friends. So if four of your mates were drunk last night, the chances are you are too. If four of your mates aren't great at home, don't love their, lives well, don't love their wives well, they're unfaithful, if they're negative and complaining, people that are critical all the time, the chances are that you are too. But if the four of your friends are people who love the Lord, who love what's been entrusted to them, are faithful at home, dedicated at home, if you find them in the prayer meeting, you can be sure that that will rub onto you too. That will shape your future. Because according to Proverbs 13, 20, not only are we made for friendship, our friendships will make us. Will make us too. That's why friendship matters. Now let's consider, how does it happen? How do we make friends? How does, how does friendship happen? Well, Proverbs 27, verse 9 says, Oil and perfume make the heart glad, and the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. I know what you're thinking, what has that to do with how to make friends? Well, we haven't read the wrong verse. There's a lovely insight here into that verse and the language of that verse. Some of your translations might have the pleasantness of a friend. Pleasantness or sweetness, it has to do in the original with sugar or sweetening food. And commentators point out, you see, that when Proverbs was written, nobody had invented sugar yet. No artificial, sweet, no artificial sweeteners. There's no way to, to sweeten food. Food wasn't created sweet or, or made sweet. It was discovered. You tasted honey and saw that it was good. And the Bible uses this metaphor for sweetness to describe friendship. So Tim Keller makes this point around how friendships happen. He says, friendship cannot be created. It can only be discovered. It can only be discovered. They happen around a common concern or a common interest. And so the typical expression of the beginning of a friendship is this. What? You too? I thought I was the only one. What? You too? I thought I was the only one. That's where they're born. You see, believe it or not, church can be one of the loneliest crowds you'll ever sit or stand in. And that might be your experience. Because it's entirely possible to... Even in the buzz of here, come in those doors, leave through those doors, never speak to anybody, never really be known by anybody, never make acquaintance with anybody. And yet the Bible reminds us that we can get by without friends, but we cannot flourish without them. You can survive without them, but you can't truly really live without them. And so I wanted to do this message actually today and change the order around a bit because in a few weeks, we're going to be launching a new season of Life Groups again. And so the heart behind Life Groups is not to take up another evening in your week. It's not to fill the calendar. We all have plenty to do. The heart behind it is a voyage of a discovery. It's a voyage of a discovery of what me too's, what you too. A discovery of friendship around common interests, common vision under the Lord's banner. And so we have all sorts of groups around stages of life, around activities, interests, sports, ministry, prayer, Bible study, farmers. It's an uprising of loneliness. It's an uprising against isolation to lead you to put the, the divine connections into your life and into my life, a support system that will lead us to blessing and not to ruin that will propel you into what God has for you. So please look out for that in the coming weeks. We'll be starting again in October, and just know as well, I don't know the road you've walked in your life, but there'll be someday in this place, and they're walking through something at the minute, and they're crying out to hear you say what? Me too. Me too. So number one, why friendship is important. Number two, how it happens. It's discovered. It's not made, but then it's built on. Number three, what? friendship looks like. I want to give you three characteristics of a biblical friend, a biblical friend 
that we see in Proverbs. So Proverbs 17, verse 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. Isn't it amazing here how Solomon distinguishes between family and friends? How many, and especially over here, don't look at anybody beside you, because I know this is a lovely day, but how many people's family members just do their head in? There's days you just could see them far enough. You fall out, you fall in, they rub you up the wrong way, there's sibling rivalry going on. She got jeans this week and I didn't get them. She got a new foundation brush and I didn't. That's our house on a daily basis. And there they're sitting. Sibling rivalry. But Solomon's saying that a friend adds something to your life that family doesn't necessarily bring. He says, they might not have your blood, but they'll always have your back. And so the first characteristic of genuine friendship I see is this, consistency. Consistency. And Luke 15, the prodigal son learned a harsh lesson in consistency. You see, because when he had the money, he could wine and dine them, he could give them access, he had more friends than he could count, he could take them to fancy events and black ties and take them to all these places, move them up the social ladder, move these, introduce people to important folk and he was just a means to an end for a lot of people. But the minute the money ran out, his friends ran out too. And in Luke 15, the prodigal's left with nothing for company but the pigs that he was feeding, scratching around in the muck his, himself at the lowest point of his life and no company. See, if you have friends whose attachment to you is based on the service you provide and what they can get from you, they're not friends at all. They're not biblical friends at all. Some years ago, a British newspaper offered a prize for the best definition of friendship. Thousands of entries came in, but here's the one that got the prize. Here's the one that won. It read as follows. A friend is one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. A friend is one who comes in when the whole world has gone out. Let me ask you this morning, do you have a friend like that? Do you have people in your life like that? Do you know someone like that? A friend is one who comes in when the whole world, when everything's went wrong, when you're stuck in the pig pen, the money's run out, everything's abandoned you. Do you have a friend who'll walk in when the world will go out? A friend that'll love you at your worst. But the subtle challenge of biblical friendship is not probably, I believed, in the ability to love someone at their worst. It's more subtle than that. It's more subtle than when the money's run out and there's illness comes and you're in the pig pen. Rather, genuine, consistent friendship is revealed in the ability to celebrate you at your best. Now, watch this really carefully. 1 Samuel 16, verses 21 and 22. And David came to Saul and entered his service. Now, watch this. And Saul loved him greatly. And he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. 1 Samuel 16. Now go to 1 Samuel 18. Two chapters later. Verse 8. Verse 11. Saul had a spear in his hand. For he thought, I will pin David to the wall. Verse 13, Saul removed him from his presence. He removed him from his presence. He unfriended. He hit the unfriend button on David. Now, you ask yourself, how did Saul go from loving David, from wanting him to abide with him permanently in 16, to casting him out of his presence in 18? How does that happen? Well, the answer is chapter 17. David killed Goliath. You see, when David killed Goliath and God blessed him and people started to celebrate him, Saul didn't like it. And the Bible says that Saul loved David greatly while he was his armor bearer. See, friends, some people will be your friend while you carry their stuff, while you get in line. While you operate from their shadow, they enjoy superiority. But the moment David had some success of his own, the moment David, or God put his hand in David's life, Saul put him out of his presence. Put him out of his presence. See, often the test of true biblical friendship is not will a person love you at your worst, it's will they celebrate you at your best. 
Will they be there at your best when you've come out of the shadow or will they unfriend you? Because you don't need them anymore. See, a lot of friendship is based on the need to be needed. But when, you, when, 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 you're, not so nece- when you're not so necessary anymore, when you're not the lifeline anymore, when they can stand on their own feet, will you still be a friend? Will you celebrate them at your worst? See, friends, if you don't have someone in your life who can encourage you when times are going well, who can compliment you, who can celebrate an achievement, you don't have a biblical friend. You don't have a biblical friend. And here's the thing I love. In the midst of all that's going on and all the issues David has, the most beautiful friendship is formed in all the scriptures. David and Jonathan. The Bible says that their souls were knit together. Knit together. And it's an amazing friendship because Jonathan was Saul's son. And Jonathan knew that David, Jonathan should have been the heir to that throne, but he knew that it was going to be David. And yet in spite of that, in spite of the fact that he knew he probably was going to have to play second fiddle, in fact, and in spite of the fact that he knew he was going to have to get in line and he knew he was going to have to live in David's shadow, Jonathan loved David anyway. You see, a true friend resists competition and resists rivalry. That's why Solomon says, A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for adversity. There's no sibling rivalry there. Friendship resists competition and it resists rivalry. That's how it works within the friendship of the Trinity. That's why I said we're made in the image of God and so how it works there is how it works here. The Spirit testifies of the Son. John 15, 26. The Spirit testifies of the Son. He highlights Jesus. He celebrates Jesus. The Son brings glory to the Father, John 17. He says, isn't he awesome? Isn't my Father awesome? It's this friendship of mutual celebration. No rivalry, no competition. It's this friendship that's existed for all time of celebration. Who love at the worst and celebrate at the best. A friend loves at all times. Consistency. Do you have a friend like that? Second trait of biblical friendship is this. Honesty. Honesty. I watched an interview because he was all in the headlines this week. It happened a few years ago. Pierce Morgan interviewed Cristiano Ronaldo and asked him, Cristiano, he says, how many people do you truly trust? Now, at the last count, and it's probably moving all the time, 341 million Instagram followers, uh, backroom staff for the teams that he plays for. I think he's his own chef, probably, gardener, all this kind of stuff. Hundreds, plethora of people around him every day say 341 million Instagram followers. And he asked him this question. He says, Cristiano, how many people do you actually trust? He thought about it for a moment. And he said, four persons. Four people. And that mass, four people that he knew he could be honest with, he could be authentic with, and they would be honest with him. Four people, 341 million Instagram followers. I have about 100, 341 million. And all this entourage and all this crew of people that he has, four persons. Proverbs 27, 6, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but the enemy multiplies kisses. So you might think that that reads the wrong way around because surely it's an enemy that wounds us. Surely it's friends that ought to multiply kisses. But the point that Solomon is making here. He says that see when a genuine friend wounds you, when they challenge you in something, when they say something that's, that's it's hurtful even for you to receive, those are wounds you can trust. You can trust those wounds. He says what you shouldn't trust is the multiplication of kisses. And I retranslated it, let me say this, kiss-ups. When you've surrounded yourself with people that never challenge you, that never disagree with you, people that never wound you, you might feel good because we can preserve people's feelings. You might feel good, but trouble's around the corner. Trouble will be around the corner in that situation. There's a striking example of this that we can read of in Galatians 2. Among the apostles, Peter, the chief apostle, if you like, Peter is ministering in in the New Testament and he used to eat with the Gentiles. And he, he dined with them, these, these outcasts, and Peter would meet them and eat with them and, until the Jews came. And the Jews started to look at him and say, Peter, why are you doing that? And all of a sudden, Peter started to withdraw from these people to, in order to impress her because he didn't want to look bad in front of the Jews. And Paul saw what he was doing. 
because Peter was being inconsistent. Peter was compromising his integrity. And in compromising his integrity, he was compromising his ministry. Paul saw it, and Paul loved him enough to confront him on it. And so Paul went, and the Bible says, I opposed him to his face and says, Peter, what you're doing is wrong. It's wrong. Paul loved Peter enough to wound him. He loved him enough to wound him. In fact, this is a challenge to us all today, church. Am I happy? Am I prepared? Do I have the courage to take up my knife, take out my knife, and on the few occasions, and I I want to emphasize the few occasions, if you have somebody that's wounding you consistently, get rid of them. If you have somebody that wounds you all the time, get rid of them. But on the few occasions that it needs to be done, am I prepared to wound somebody, not for their pain, but for their progress? Not for the sake of doing it, not for their pain, but for their progress. Proverbs 29.5, a man who flatters his neighbor spreads a net for his feet. He flatters his neighbor, he spreads a net, a net for his feet. You see, because we have this notion that if we just be nice to everybody, if we just get along with everybody, if we just be kind and sweet and all things nice, everything will be okay, but it's untrue and it's unhelpful. And what we do, in effect, is we, we don't love people well enough, we, we spread a trap for their feet. Even when we saw it coming, we allow them to plunge headlong into it. So let me ask you today, do you have someone in your life who will be honest with you? Do I have somebody in my life who will be honest with me, who is so committed to your progress, to your growth, to your character, that they will love you enough to cut you? That they'll love you enough to cut you? See, that's why I began with consistency. Because in order to receive faithful wounds, but don't miss this, in order to receive faithful wounds, you have to have faithful friends. You have to have faithful friends. That's why I said at the start, the beginning, of the choice of your friends will shape you, it will make you. If you get that wrong, trouble lies ahead. You see, the fact of the matter is this, we should be kind to everybody, authentic to everybody, but you ought not to be transparent with everybody. And I'll explain what I mean by that now. Darius Daniels puts it this way. This is good. He says, people in our lives should be loved biblically, valued equally, but they should be treated differently. You don't treat everybody the same. You see, you have to know who your friends are because those people will get different access to you. You don't just bear your soul with anybody. Access to my heart, access to my emotions, access to my secrets... You dare not, you have to get that right. You have to know that the person you're trusting there is faithful. That's why we treat people differently. Because if you give somebody access and you let people speak into your life, you let people minister into your life and they're neither motivated by love for you and they're not consistent with you either, they will shape you according to their agenda, not according to God's agenda. They'll shape you the wrong way. You tell them personal stuff and it'll end up in the guardian. So be careful who you give the permission of friendship. It really matters. The old writers, I love this phrase that they had that Matthew Henry will come up with if you ever read him. He talks about bosom friends. Old Puritan boys used to talk about bosom friends. And the idea with this is like like the David and Jonathan thing. They were knit together. Knit together, thick and thin. And one of them said this when it came to choosing friends. He said, in the choice of a bosom friend, some respect ought to be had to his prudence. Some men, though holy, are indiscreet, and in point of secrets are like sieves. They can keep nothing committed to them, but let all run through. Now, what's this? It is good to test him, to try him, whom we intend for a bosom friend, before we trust him. You see, you don't give yourself away. You don't give unrestricted access because you have a good feeling about somebody. You like them a bit. That's why C.S. Lewis is really clear in this. He says, of all the friendship, friendship's deliberate because there's nothing, there's nothing inside you really that longs for it. It doesn't make you have sweaty palms and your heart race. It's not like a romantic thing. Friendship's different to that. And so the point being made here is that you don't select friends based on feelings You select them based on fruit. Not on feelings, based on fruit. And so the wounds of a faithful friend, 
Somebody that's demonstrated faithfulness, consistency, honesty. The wounds of a faithful friend can be trusted. And not only can be trusted, they're absolutely essential for what God wants to do in your life. So be careful, friends, today in whose hand you put a knife. Be careful in whose hand you put a knife. Be careful who you let cut you. Here's the third trait, really quickly, of a biblical friend. Honesty, consistency. Worship team can come back up. Nearly done. Honesty, consistency. Here's the third one. Sensitivity. I wanted to mention this too because this is important. Proverbs 27, 14. See if you can find yourself in this verse. If anyone loudly blesses their neighbor in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. Anybody not a, particularly a morning person here? I tell you, a few hands, a few people are honest. You know, it takes you to about 11 o'clock, and these exuberant people that are just full of the joys of life, you could see them far enough. You know, you just, you're different. You could do the common way a warning sign that says approach with caution before 11. But what's really been said there, as somebody that's trying to be all cordial and, and greet people and be exuberant, if you don't know the person, you're actually just getting on their nerves. And so what really has been said here is that we're dealing with somebody who lacks any level of emotional intelligence, if you like, any, any, any level of understanding, any level of sensitivity. And that one might seem funny, but this is more serious. Proverbs 26, 18 to 19. Like a madman who throws firebrands, arrows, and death is the man who deceives his neighbor and then turns around and says, oh, I was only joking. I was only joking. See, what that says is I don't understand you. I haven't considered your feelings there. I didn't realize that that joke actually offends you. It actually hurts you. The journey that you've been on, what you've had to walk, the insecurity that you have, that actually is harmful for you. And the Bible says that loose talk, saying something in jest that attacks somebody's insecurities and the things that, the things that are strongholds to them, the things that hold them back is like a madman running about throwing firebrands and throwing arrows and causing death. And instead of propelling you forward, some relationships like that will cause you to retreat through insecurity and never fulfill, go into your shell and never fulfill all that God has purposed you to do. And a flippant, I'm only joking, won't fix it. Insensitive friends can sabotage where you're going and they're not friends at all. I loved one of those definitions. I didn't read it earlier, but it was one of the runners-up in the British newspaper thing. It said this, A friend is someone who understands my silence. A friend is someone who understands my silence. He used the word sensitivity. I could have used the word understanding. A friend is someone who gets me, has a sense of what's appropriate. And so the question before us today is, do we have friends like that? Do I have friends like that? Bigger question, am I a friend like that? Someone who's consistent, someone who's honest, someone who's sensitive. It's a biblical friend. You see, the only reason that we have even the remotest chance of being a friend like that is because of Jesus Christ. I said a few weeks ago, we were, we were talking in here about love, and I said that you cannot give what you can't receive. It's impossible. And so it is only receiving and in receiving the friendship of Jesus that gives us the power to be a friend to anyone else. Gives us the power to be a biblical friend to anyone else. He's a friend you can trust. Jesus is a friend you can trust this morning. He, he, he loved you so much at your worst that he went to hell to save you. And he celebrates us so well at our best that he's gone to heaven to prepare a place for us. Loved us at the worst, celebrate us at the best. He's the one who walks in when the whole world has gone out. When they ring the bell at night in the hospital, when you're left in the bed yourself and it's time for the visitors to leave, he's the one that comes in when everybody else goes out. That's Jesus. And even when Peter denied Knowing Jesus. See, sometimes circumstances change and people will deny that they ever knew you. They'll not claim you anymore. And Peter stopped claiming Jesus. He denied that he knew him, but Jesus never stopped claiming him. 
You might disown, you might have people who disown you in trouble. Jesus never will. He's not jealous. He's not insecure. He says, everything that the Father has told me, I've declared unto you. A lot of people don't do that because their value or their status in the sense is preserved in what they know that you don't know. Sense of superiority. Jesus doesn't do that. He says, everything I've received, I give to you. More than that, he says, see the works that I've done? You'll do greater. Now there's a friend that will give you a platform and set you into all that God's called you to be. He's consistent. What a friend. He's consistent. His wounds can be trusted. When he corrects us, he corrects us for our benefit. He says, when I correct a prune, why do I do it? So that you'll bear more fruit. It's for increase in your life. He's sensitive. He understands. Hebrews says we haven't a high priest that cannot be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. He gets it. He's touched by our pain. In fact, he lost his friendship with God so that we could be friends of God. He was rejected, that we could be accepted. He's touched, he's moved by what concerns us. Friends, he is the ultimate traveling companion for this life. Bar none. The ultimate. And if you can receive his friendship, his friendship will empower you. It will sort these things that are internal in all of us, all these hang-ups and insecurities we have. It will empower you to live free from performance, free from rejection, from competition, from insecurity, from inconsistency. Then that's the type of friend, if you can receive it from him, that's the type of friend you'll be able to be. And because he gives you the power to be it, he gives you the opportunity to have it. See, part of the reason many of us don't have great friends is because we're not great friends. But because he gives us the power to be it, he gives us the opportunity to have it. Real, genuine, biblical friendship. I don't know how many friends you have on your Facebook or your Instagram or how many colleagues or how many people run in your posse or your crew or whatever it's called, how many teammates you have, how many associates. But I do know this. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. His name is Jesus. Old hymn writer said, I found a friend in Jesus. He's wonderful to me. He's the fairest of 10,000. What a friend. Let's pray together. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for a friend like Jesus today. I thank you for someone who will love us at our worst and celebrate us at our best. He'll be there when the net's full. He'll be there when the net's empty. What a friend. And so, Father, if we've sat under your word today, I pray you would shape us and change us. If we don't know that friend, Lord, would you call people to yourself? Minister to hearts today, we pray, Lord. Help us to go and do likewise. Help us. That's our prayer. Make us more like Jesus. Make us a friend like Jesus. The people in the world would say, those people love each other in there. Those people are consistent in there. Those people are honest in there. They're sensitive in there. I want a friend like that. Thank you for your word, Lord. Bless it to us, for we ask in Jesus' name.